I ask that you would remain standing for the reading of God's Holy Word. Our sermon text this morning is Psalm 39. We are engaged in a, a brief sojourn in the Psalms as we head towards the Christmas season. And this morning we come to Psalm 39. I'll be reading the entire Psalm, verses 1 through 13. Please listen now as I read, for this is the very Word of God. I said, I will guard my ways, that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail. And my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me, that I may smile again, before I depart, and am no more. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you would aid us, instruct us, and equip us to face the challenges of this life with a perspective that can only come from beyond this life. Bless us now, we pray. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you could manage to take a break from the hustle and bustle of life, and if you can bring yourself to pause long enough to consider something of the nature of life itself, you will eventually come to a conclusion that is on the one hand so overwhelmingly obvious that it cannot be denied. And at the same time, it is so shockingly subversive that many would desire to keep it a secret. And that conclusion is this, everybody dies. Some die young in circumstances that we would see as sudden and even tragic. Some succumb to the infirmities of age, but everybody dies. Some die poor with nothing in their hands. Others die wealthy, but they cannot take it with them. And in the end, everybody dies. Some die as what the world would say are lifelong failures, having accomplished nothing of repute. Others die with great accomplishments to their name, but regardless, everybody dies, able to accomplish no more. Some never married, never have children, and die alone. Some marry and have many children and grandchildren, but all die in the end. So do spouses, so do children, so do grandchildren. And in the end, everybody lies in the casket alone. Some live immoral, selfish, and hateful lives so that people do not mourn their passing but welcome it. Others live good, virtuous, and kind lives so that their, their passing is met with sighs and tears. But everyone dies all the same. 
And if one actually takes the time to consider the cold, hard, and inevitable reality of death, it can begin to make life feel a little pointless, empty, even vain. What does it matter, we say, if it all ends in death? And yet we seem to intuitively recognize that it's not really right to think this way. We shouldn't speak thus. So we wonder if perhaps it is just better not to think about such things, not to say anything on the subject, just go along to get along and live with a smile. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever stopped long enough to think about such things? Have you ever had such thoughts that unsettled your heart? Thoughts about life. Thoughts about death and the struggle to find meaning in it all. Well, if you ever have, or you ever do, then know this. You have a friend, a contemplative companion in David. Because this is exactly where David found himself as he penned the words to Psalm 39. David was thinking about life, thinking about death and trying to make some sense of it all. And he does so in uh, what, I, what, what I think is a challenging and thoughtful and in some ways a rather surprising manner. And that's what he offers to us here this morning in Psalm 39. Now Psalm 39 can be broken down, I think, into four distinct parts. This morning we want to consider each part in turn. So we turn our attention to the, the first section, the first part of Psalm 39. 39, which is found in verses 1 through 3. I've entitled this section, David's Dilemma. David's Dilemma. The challenge before David as he pens this psalm is to speak or not to speak. It seems that David has thoughts in his head, and he wants to talk about them. But they're not easy thoughts. They're unsettling thoughts. He seems to know these thoughts might be a little rough around the edges. He has questions and not necessarily answers. He knows his thoughts may be taken out of context, twisted by those who have darker agendas. He doesn't want to do that. So he starts off by deciding he's just going to keep his thoughts to himself. We read in verse 1, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. You see, David seems to not altogether trust what will come out of his mouth. And he certainly doesn't trust what the wicked might do with his words. So he endeavors to be silent. Now let me just offer, I think, a brief word of application just from this one thought. We live in a world where we are often encouraged to have No filter. Every thought, every idea that pops into our heads, we say, it should be out there. Put it on social media. It should all be shared. It should all be shared publicly with the whole world. But I would suggest to us that a filter, a guard, even a muzzle on our mouths and our keyboards and our smartphones is not always such a bad thing. There are times where we should be circumspect with our own thoughts and certainly our own words. We should be guarded about how people might take our words and take our thoughts out of context. And I think many of us would do well to think and deliberate and even muzzle our words for a time before sharing our every thought with the world. We see that David does this for a time. And yet we see that his discipline and his prudence does not then yield him peace. In fact, he says that his distress grew worse and worse, as we see in verse 2. His heart became hot within him. The more he thought, the more he mused, as the text says, the more the, the fire of his thoughts burned within him so that he needed to get his thoughts out there. 
He needed to say what was on his mind. He needed to speak in order that he might search and find answers and resolutions to what troubled him. So after some time of silence, his words give way. And so often it must be with us and our deep thoughts. We, we should not rush to speech. Scripture says we should be slow to speak, quick to listen, but eventually the time comes where we, we, we are right to share our thoughts, ask our questions, and seek resolution to what troubles us in our inner being. And so, after a season of silence, David speaks. But note, he speaks first and foremost to the Lord. And this then brings us to the second portion of the psalm, which we find in verses 4 through 6, which I've entitled David's Desire. David's Desire. David finally articulates what is on his heart and mind, and it all has to do with the brevity of life and the inevitability of death. David says in verse 5, You, Lord, have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. A handbreadth was one of the smaller measurements in ancient Israelite society. It was kind of like saying, Lord, you measure my life in inches, not in yards, not in miles. It's like nothing. And it's clear David's not just thinking about the brevity of his own life as if he's some kind of unique case, but he's thinking about human life in general, for he states, Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. And it's clear here David's not just thinking about the brevity of life. He's, he's thinking about the seeming inconsequential nature of that brevity. He says life is a mere breath, verse 5. It's a shadow, verse 6. Man toils and experiences turmoil for nothing and heaps up wealth to what he says is a a certain, uncertain result. The word that David uses here for nothing, for breath in verse 5, it's the same Hebrew word that the author of Ecclesiastes uses when he famously declares, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's a rich word. It can mean vanity, meaninglessness, breath, mist, Vapor. The point here is that not only is life short, it just doesn't seem to matter. Everybody dies and their lives come to nothing. It's like trying to grab a handful of mist and put it in your pocket. That's what David's thinking about. That's what he dared not speak This is what burned within him and robbed him of peace. But what's interesting here in this section is that these thoughts, this inner fire that was clearly unsettling his heart and mind, it doesn't drive David to despair. This section is not entitled David's despair, but David's desire, because these thoughts fuel a very particular request. He he expresses a very particular desire. We see it in verse 4. He says, oh, Lord, in light of this reality, make me know my end. What is the measure of my days? You see, David is not looking to escape from the reality that life is short. He's not looking to dismiss the idea that things pass away. He wants to really and truly know it. He wants to confront and and lay hold of this reality, for for it is true. He dare not deny it. If David were walking around a a mall, he might say to us all, you know, buying clothes at a store named Forever 21 doesn't make it so. (laughs) No, life comes and goes, and it ends rather quickly. And David wants to really know about that end. He wants to live wisely in light of that end. David here is essentially making the same plea that Moses makes when he penned Psalm 90, when he says, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. 
David here is saying, look, I don't, I don't want to live like I'm going to live forever, right? I dare not live without a clear sense of my inevitable death. I dare not live as if the trials I face today are somehow ultimate and lasting. And No, this, this too shall pass. The day will come when the trials of today are inconsequential. They will be gone and no one will remember them. And David says, Lord, I want to see that reality. I want to know the reality of my end. I want to rightly assess the measure of my days and the fleeting nature of my life. I don't want to pretend. I don't want to live out my days with delusions of enduring grandeur. I want to be real, true, wise. How about you this morning? Do you want these things? For starters, are, are we willing to pause long enough to really think about life? Are we willing to think about the fleeting nature of our existence? And then the question becomes, if you're willing to think about that, even for a moment, are you willing to stay there for very long? Or does that thought make you so uncomfortable that you just want to rush back to the hustle and bustle of life, live with a kind of denial of death? Or like David, are you willing to, to linger on the idea? Say, I actually want to know more about this truth. I want the wisdom that comes from living in light of reality. Oh, Lord, don't, don't let me try to escape with mind-numbing amusement. Don't let me try to distract myself with work. No, I want to know the measure of my days. I want to know how fleeting I am because, as David says here, because you, O oh Lord, have made my life this brief. You, in fact, have orchestrated things this way. So I want to know what's the purpose of all this. I want to get to the bottom of my brevity. I want to see substance and purpose in the breath, in the midst in the mist, in the seeming vanity of it all. Lord, make me to know it. So this is David's dilemma, which then gives way to David's desire, which then pushes David to consider his deliverance. This brings us to the third section of the psalm. We see it in verses 7 through 11. Again, David's deliverance. Given the brevity of his life, given the fleeting nature of his days, given the seeming inconsequential nature of his deeds, David declares, and now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. It's clear David realizes, right, in his fleeting, breath-like existence. There's nothing he can turn to in all the world that can provide him with a solid anchor for the soul. There's nothing solid. Everything's fading away, so he must turn to something beyond the world. He must turn to the Lord who made the world, who existed before it all, who spoke this very creation into being. He turns to the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. For only the eternal God can deliver us from the fleeting nature of our breath-like existence. And David realizes, given that all of life is passing away, what ultimately matters then is being right with the eternal God. But we see here that David's hope in God and his appeal for deliverance is it's rooted in something very deep and profound. It's rooted in confession of sin and the desire to be relieved from judgment, relieved from the consequences that his sinful actions deserve. So he says, deliver me from all my transgressions. David goes on. It's clear in his mind that the, the scorn of the fool, the passing away of all his days, this is ultimately an act of God. He says, you have done it, Lord, in verse 9. You see, the Lord's stroke is upon him. 
The hostility of the Lord bears down upon him in judgment. The Lord's discipline and rebuke weighs upon him. The Lord consumes that which is dear to him and ultimately consumes life itself. Why is this? Well, David knows. He embraces what the scripture teaches, that the the fleeting nature of life and death itself is ultimately the consequence of sin. As the scripture says, the wages of sin is death. We can go back to the very beginning, to the Garden of Eden and our first parents. God declared to Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat the forbidden fruit, in that day when you disobey me, you will surely die. And of course, they sinned. They fell under the curse of sin and death. And the scripture says, we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, that all die because all have sinned. So David is laying a hold of something very deep here. He recognizes that life always ends in death. That this life is fleeting. Death comes to us all. And yet this is not a mere observation. He doesn't want to run from this reality. He, he wants to learn from this reality. He wants to live in light of this truth. And this truth, the truth about his death, leads him to put his hope in the living God. He knows then, at a deeper level, because of God's revelation, that death flows from sin. And so he hopes in God and appeals to God that God would deliver him from his transgressions. He asks God here in this text to remove the punishment, to remove the stroke, the consuming discipline of God's justice in his life. See, David understands the fleeting nature of his life, the inevitability of his death, It must drive him to the only source of life, which is God, and it must cause him to ask for relief from the source of death, which is sin. What about you this morning? You're going to die. You cannot stop it. Your life is indeed like dust in the wind. (laughs) It slips away, and all your money won't another penny. All your money won't another minute buy. (laughs) You can deny it. You can pretend. You can amuse yourself in the moment, but as Neil Postman famously wrote, in the end, you will just amuse yourself to death. You can work, you can strive, you can pursue, you can achieve, but in the end, your days will be spent and all you achieve will pass away. So what will you do? I adjure you to hope in the Lord, to seek his deliverance from your sin and transgression For death is coming, night is moving, and in the end, all that will matter is if you are right with the Lord, the living and eternal one, if he has delivered you from your sin. That's all that will matter. But you say, but what difference would that make? I mean, if we all die anyway, what does it even matter if we're right with the Lord? If in the end we're all snuffed out, the the breath of our life breathes its last, who cares about anything? Who cares about God? Who cares about forgiveness or deliverance from sin? Well, that brings us to our final section, verses 12 and 13, in which David's original dilemma, which then leads to David's desire, which flows into David's Hope for deliverance leads to David's ultimate destiny. David's destiny. Here in these final verses, David makes his final appeal. In the face of death, the root of which is sin, David appeals for deliverance. He yearns for God's saving action with the knowledge that in the end, he says, 
that he is a sojourner with God, a guest like all his fathers. Very interesting little phrase. I would argue that in many ways, this little phrase is the foundation that this entire psalm is built on. It's rooted in a deep grasp of biblical history and God's purposes and plans to save his people. To understand it, we have to go all the way back to Abraham, where God promised his people a land, a place for them to dwell with God, a place where God would be with them, would dwell among them, and there he would be their God, and they would be his people. Now, we see in the Old Testament that God promised Abram the the, the land of Canaan. And it was very literally the promised land. He eventually gave it to Israel. And yet here is a very powerful spiritual truth. A truth that undergirds all our conversations in the Bible about the promised land. And it is this, that the land of Canaan was never the ultimate end. The When Abraham dwelt in the land, when Joshua led his people into that land in conquest, when David established his kingdom in that land, when the people of Israel were exiled and then returned to that land, through it all, the physical land was never the ultimate point. But in fact, it was always pointing all the people of God to something else, something greater, something higher. The author of Hebrews tells us very clearly what that something was and is. He writes in Hebrews 11 that that when Abraham went to live in the land of promise, he lived there as in a foreign land because, the text says, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder was God. Oh, yeah, well, what city did Abraham have in mind? What land was he looking for? Well, the author of Hebrews goes on to say that Abraham and all those who came after him in the Old Testament, they all died in faith. Even if they died in the promised land, they did not receive in this life the things promised. But it says, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, they acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he prepared for them a city. You see... What the scripture says, what it has said in the Old Testament and the New, is that this life, this fleeting, breath-like, shadow-like, sin-scarred life, it is not the end. But that God has actually prepared and built a heavenly city, a heavenly country for those who hope in him. For those who believe in the Lord, who confess their sin, who cry out for the Lord's deliverance in accordance with his promise, God is pleased to save them. And in death, he is pleased to usher them into an eternal, heavenly country. And this promise was in the Old Testament. God promised to take away the sin of his people, to turn aside his wrath, and punishment for sin through the sacrifice of the lamb. Having atoned for the people's sin, he promised to dwell with his people as they sojourned through life, looking for the ultimate city of heaven, even when they lived in the promised land. There, God would ultimately welcome his people into an eternal heavenly home with himself. This is what Abraham was looking for. This is what Moses was looking for. And this is what David is looking for here in Psalm 39. And of course, we know that in the fullness of time, God then sent his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to accomplish this ultimate salvation. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. He too was a sojourner 
a pilgrim on the earth. And yet in his pilgrim journey, he walked with the Father in perfect holiness, perfect righteousness. He had no transgressions. He didn't have to die. And yet Jesus willingly took all the sin, all the transgressions of all of God's people. He took it all upon himself and he suffered and died for our sin in our place. Jesus bore the scorn of fools, the stroke of the Father's perfect justice. He felt God's hostility, God's holiness towards sin, and he bore the consuming fire of God's discipline and rebuke. He bore it all unto death and judgment. In doing so, his life seemed but a, a few hand breaths. It seemed like nothing before the world, a mere breath, a shadow, a mist, a vapor. And yet Jesus was pleased to wait on the Father, to hope in him. And God the Father delivered him from all the transgressions of his People, He did this by raising Jesus from the dead. And in the deliverance of Jesus, there is hope for all who trust in Jesus that we too will be delivered. This is true for all those who held on to the promise of Jesus from the Old Testament. And it is true today for all who hope on the sure testimony of Jesus now. All who hope in Jesus are delivered from the sting of death. We know through faith in Christ that even if we die, yet shall we live. And we know that God has indeed prepared a place for all who believe. He has prepared for us a country, a city, a heavenly home for all who trust in Christ. And this heavenly country is where our true citizenship lies. It is our true home, our true consolation, and our eternal hope. So what does that mean for us today? Well, first, let me say, if you do not believe in Christ, death is coming fast. It will surely sweep you away. And in the face of death's consuming power, in the face of God's consuming rebuke and punishment, I warn you, you have no hope. You have no deliverance. And so I would appeal to you today to turn to Christ in faith, to hope in his death and his resurrection, to cry out for his deliverance from all your sin. I appeal to you, do it soon. As David says in the final verse of the psalm, look away from me, O God. What he, what he means there is look, look away from, do not look upon me in judgment. Turn your judgment away from me before I die, which is coming soon, and I am no more. Friends, the time is now. The hour is fast approaching. When your brief life will end and you will be no more on the earth. And the stroke of God's judgment, the hostility of his divine hand will remain upon you. So repent and hope in the Lord. Cry out for deliverance in Christ and I tell you, deliverance will surely come. And if you do hope in the Lord, if you have, if you do well, then know this. Even as we face all kinds of troubles in this life, even though we feel the fleeting nature of our lives, even though death is all around us, we need not be afraid. As Christians, like David before us, we, we don't have to live in denial of death. Neither do we have to live in fear of death. We can face it head on. We can take the brief time that the Lord has given us and live as faithful sojourners on the earth, looking to bless others in word and deed, knowing our time is short, our opportunities are short. 
but also our afflictions are but short and momentary as well. And in Christ, we can face it all. Our fleeting moments and our days and our trials and our afflictions, we can face it all knowing that God is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. We look forward to that day, knowing that today, the Lord is actually pleased to use our labors here and now for his purposes so that our our fleeting labors today are actually not in vain. No, all our griefs, all our losses, all our labors, all our hopes, they're all bound up in his eternal purposes. And at the end of our pilgrim journey, we will... We will stand before our Savior and there will indeed be solid joys and lasting treasures and pleasures that none but the Lord's people know. So let us think deeply about life and death. Let us speak clearly and boldly about the things of eternity. Let us hope and pray earnestly while there is still time until the day comes when we see our Savior face to face and his grace ever more enfolds us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We are easily overwhelmed by life and death. And yet we take great hope in knowing that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, has lived and died and been raised to eternal life. Death no longer has power over him. He will never die again. And he grants to all who believe in him eternal life so that we can face the fleeting character of this life, the disappointments, the hardships, the griefs, the losses. We can face it all with eternal hope and courage, conviction, and even joy. Grant us such faith. Grant us such hope that we may live our fleeting days in faithfulness until we see our Savior face to face. And even so we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus.